Muhammad Ali was an American professional boxer, activist, entertainer, poet, and philanthropist. Nicknamed the greatest, he is widely regarded as one of the most significant and celebrated sports figures of the 20th century, and is frequently ranked as the greatest heavyweight boxer of all time. In 1999, he was named Sportsman of the Century by Sports Illustrated, and the Sports Personality of the Century by the BBC. Born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, he began training as an amateur boxer at age 12. At 18, he won a gold medal in the light heavyweight division at the 1960 Summer Olympics and turned professional later that year. He became a Muslim after 1961. He won the World Heavyweight Championship from Sonny Liston in a major upset on February 25, 1964, at age 22. Also that year, he renounced his birth name as a slave name and formally became known as Muhammad Ali. In 1966, Ali refused to be drafted into the military owing to his religious beliefs and ethical opposition to the Vietnam War and was found guilty of draft evasion and stripped of his boxing titles. He stayed out of prison while appealing the decision to the Supreme Court, where his conviction was overturned in 1971. However, he had not fought for nearly four years by this point and had lost a period of peak performance as an athlete. Ali's actions as a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War made him an icon for the larger 1960s counterculture generation, and he was a very high-profile figure of racial pride for African Americans during the civil rights movement, and throughout his career. As a Muslim, Ali was initially affiliated with Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam. He later disavowed the Noi, adhering to Sunni Islam, and supported racial integration like his former mentor Malcolm X. He fought in several historic boxing matches, such as his highly publicized fights with Sonny Liston, Joe Fraser, the thriller in Manila, and his fight with George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle. Ali thrived in the spotlight at a time when many boxers let their managers do the talking, and he became renowned for his provocative and outlandish persona. He was known for trash talking, and often freestyled with rhyme schemes and spoken word poetry incorporating elements of hip hop and often predicted in which round he would knock out his opponent. Outside boxing, Ali attained success as a spoken word artist, releasing two studio albums, I Am The Greatest, and The Adventures of Ali and His Gang vs. Mr. Tooth Decay. Both albums received Grammy Award nominations. He also featured as an actor and writer, releasing two autobiographies. Ali retired from boxing in 1981 and focused on religion, philanthropy and activism. In 1984, he made public his diagnosis of Parkinson's syndrome, which some reports attributed to boxing-related injuries, though he and his specialist physicians disputed this. He remained an active public figure globally, but in his later years made fewer public appearances as his condition worsened, and he was cared for by his family. Ali died on June 3, 2016. Chapter 1, Early Life and Amateur Career Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. was born on January 17, 1942, in Louisville, Kentucky. He had one brother. He was named after his father, Cassius Marcellus Clay Sr., who had a sister and four brothers and who himself was named in honor of the 19th century Republican politician and staunch abolitionist Cassius Marcellus Clay, also from the state of Kentucky. Clay's father's paternal grandparents were John Clay and Sally and Clay, Clay's sister Eva claimed that Sally was a native of Madagascar. He was a descendant of slaves of the antebellum South, and was predominantly of African descent, with some Irish and English family heritage. Ali's maternal great-grandfather, Abe Grady, emigrated from Ennis, County Clare, Ireland. DNA testing performed in 2018 showed that, through his paternal grandmother, Ali was a descendant of the former slave archer Alexander, who had been chosen from the building crew as the model of a freed man for the Emancipation Memorial, and was the subject of abolitionist William Greenleaf Elliott's book, The Story of Archer Alexander, From Slavery to Freedom. Like Ali, Alexander fought for his freedom. His father was a sign and billboard painter, and his mother, Odessa O'Grady Clay, was a domestic helper. 
Although Cassius Sr. was a Methodist, he allowed Odessa to bring up both Cassius Jr. and his younger brother, Rudolf Rudy Clay, as Baptists. Cassius Jr. attended Central High School in Louisville. He was dyslexic, which led to difficulties in reading and writing, at school and for much of his life. Ali grew up amid racial segregation. His mother recalled one occasion when he was denied a drink of water at a store, they wouldn't give him one because of his color. That really affected him. He was also strongly affected by the 1955 murder of Emmett Till, which led to young Clay and a friend taking out their frustration by vandalizing a local rail yard. His daughter Hannah later wrote that Ali once told her, nothing would ever shake me up than the story of Emmett Till. Ali was first directed toward boxing by Louisville police officer and boxing coach Joey Martin, who encountered the twelve-year-old fuming over a thief's having taken his bicycle. He told the officer he was going to whoop the thief. The officer told Clay he had better learn how to box first. Initially, Clay did not take up Martin's offer, but after seeing amateur boxers on a local television boxing program called, Tomorrow's Champions, Clay was interested in the prospect of fighting. He then began to work with trainer Fred Stoner, whom he credits with giving him the real training, eventually molding my style, my stamina and my system. For the last four years of Clay's amateur career he was trained by boxing cutman Chuck Bodak. Clay made his amateur boxing debut in 1954 against local amateur boxer Ronnie O'Keefe. He won by split decision. He went on to win six Kentucky Golden Gloves titles, two National Golden Gloves titles, an Amateur Athletic Union national title, and the light heavyweight gold medal in the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome. Clay's amateur record was 100 wins with five losses. Ali said in his 1975 autobiography that shortly after his return from the Rome Olympics, he threw his gold medal into the Ohio River after he and a friend were refused service at a whites-only restaurant and fought with a white gang. The story was later disputed, and several of Ali's friends, including Bandini Brown and photographer Howard Bingham, denied it. Brown told Sports Illustrated writer Mark Cram, Honky's sure bought into that one. Thomas Hauser's biography of Ali stated that Ali was refused service at the diner but that he lost his medal a year after he won it. Ali received a replacement medal at a basketball intermission during the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, where he lit the torch to start the Games. Chapter 2 – Early Professional Boxing Career Chapter 2 Section 1 – Early Career Clay made his professional debut on October 29, 1960, winning a six-round decision over Tunney Hunsaker. From then until the end of 1963, Clay amassed a record of 19-0 with 15 wins by knockout. He defeated boxers including Tony Esperti, Jim Robinson, Donnie Fleeman, Alonzo Johnson, George Logan, Vili Bismanoff, Lamar Clark, Doug Jones, and Henry Cooper. Clay also beat his former trainer and veteran boxer Archie Moore in a 1962 match. These early fights were not without trials. Clay was knocked down by both Sonny Banks and Cooper. In the Cooper fight, Clay was floored by a left hook at the end of round four and was saved by the bell, going on to win in the predicted fifth round due to Cooper's severely cut eye. The fight with Doug Jones on March 13, 1963 was Clay's toughest fight during this stretch. The number two and three heavyweight contenders respectively, Clay and Jones fought on Jones's home turf at New York's Madison Square Garden. Jones staggered Clay in the first round, and the unanimous decision for Clay was greeted by boos and a rain of debris thrown into the ring. Watching on closed-circuit TV, Heavyweight champ Sonny Liston quipped that if he fought Clay he might get locked up for murder. The fight was later named Fight of the Year by the Ring magazine. In each of these fights, Clay vocally belittled his opponents and vaunted his abilities. He called Jones an ugly little man and Cooper a bum. He said he was embarrassed to get in the ring with Alex Mightf and claimed that Madison Square Garden was too small for me. Ali's trash talk was inspired by professional wrestler gorgeous George Wagner's, after he saw George's talking ability attract huge crowds to events. 
Ali stated in a 1969 interview with the Associated Press Hubert Meisel, that he met with George in Las Vegas in 1961, that George told him that talking a big game, would earn paying fans who either wanted to see him win or wanted to see him lose, thus Ali transformed himself into a self-described big mouth and a bragger. In 1960, Clay left Moore's camp, partially due to Clay's refusal to do chores, such as washing dishes and sweeping. To replace Moore, Clay hired Angelo Dundee to be his trainer. Clay had met Dundee in February 1957 during Clay's amateur career. Around this time, Clay sought longtime idol Sugar Ray Robinson to be his manager, but was rebuffed. Chapter 2 Section 2 World Heavyweight Champion Chapter 2 Section 2 Subsection 2 Fights Against Liston By late 1963, Clay had become the top contender for Sonny Liston's title. The fight was set for February 25, 1964, in Miami Beach. Liston was an intimidating personality, a dominating fighter with a criminal past and ties to the mob. Based on Clay's uninspired performance against Jones and Cooper in his previous two fights, and Liston's destruction of former heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson in two first-round knockouts, Clay was a 7-to-1 underdog. Despite this, Clay taunted Liston during the pre-fight build-up, dubbing him the Big Ugly Bear, stating Liston even smells like a bear and claiming after I beat him I'm going to donate him to the zoo. Clay turned the pre-fight way in into a circus, shouting at Liston that someone is going to die at ringside tonight. Clay's pulse rate was measured at 120, more than double his normal 54. Many of those in attendance thought Clay's behavior stemmed from fear, and some commentators wondered if he would show up for the bout. The outcome of the fight was a major upset. At the opening bell, Liston rushed at Clay, seemingly angry and looking for a quick knockout. However, Clay's superior speed and mobility enabled him to elude Liston, making the champion miss and look awkward. At the end of the first round, Clay opened up his attack and hit Liston repeatedly with jabs. Liston fought better in round two, but at the beginning of the third round Clay hit Liston with a combination that buckled his knees and opened a cut under his left eye. This was the first time Liston had ever been cut. At the end of round four, Clay was returning to his corner when he began experiencing blinding pain in his eyes and asked his trainer, Angelo Dundee, to cut off his gloves. Dundee refused. It has been speculated that the problem was due to ointment used to seal Liston's cuts, perhaps deliberately applied by his corner to his gloves. Though unconfirmed, boxing historian Bert Sugar said that two of Liston's opponents also complained about their eyes burning. Despite Liston's attempts to knock out a blinded Clay, Clay was able to survive the fifth round until sweat and tears rinsed the irritation from his eyes. In the sixth, Clay dominated, hitting Liston repeatedly. Liston did not answer the bell for the seventh round, and Clay was declared the winner by TKO. Liston stated that the reason he quit was an injured shoulder. Following the win, a triumphant Clay rushed to the edge of the ring and, pointing to the ringside press, shouted, Eat your words. He added, I am the greatest. I shook up the world. I'm the prettiest thing that ever lived. At ringside post-fight, Clay appeared unconvinced that the fight was stopped, due to a Liston shoulder injury, saying that the only injury Liston had was an open eye, a big cut eye. When told by Joe Louis that the injury was a left arm thrown out of its socket, Clay quipped, yeah, swinging at nothing, who wouldn't? In winning this fight at the age of 22, Clay became the youngest boxer to take the title from a reigning heavyweight champion. However, Floyd Patterson remained the youngest to win the heavyweight championship, doing so at the age 21 during an elimination bout following Rocky Marciano's retirement. Mike Tyson broke both records in 1986 when he defeated Trevor Burbick to win the heavyweight title at age 20. Soon after the Liston fight, Clay changed his name to Cassius X, and then later to Muhammad Ali upon converting to Islam and affiliating with the Nation of Islam. Ali then faced a rematch with Liston scheduled for May 1965 in Lewiston, Maine. 
It had been scheduled for Boston the previous November, but was postponed for six months due to Ali's emergency surgery for a hernia three days before. The fight was controversial. Midway through the first round, Liston was knocked down by a difficult-to-see blow the press dubbed a phantom punch. Referee Jersey Joe Walcott did not begin the count immediately after the knockdown, as Ali refused to retreat to a neutral corner. Liston rose after he had been down for about 20 seconds, and the fight momentarily continued. However a few seconds later Walcott, having been informed by the timekeepers that Liston had been down for a count of 10, stopped the match and declared Ali the winner by knockout. The entire fight lasted less than two minutes. It has since been speculated that Liston purposely dropped to the ground. Proposed motivations include threats on his life from the Nation of Islam, that he had bet against himself and that he took a dive to pay off debts. Slow motion replays show that Liston was jarred by a chopping right from Ali, although it is unclear whether the blow was a genuine knockout punch. Chapter 2 Section 2 Subsection 3 Fight Against Patterson Ali defended his title against former heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson on November 22, 1965. Before the match, Ali mocked Patterson, who was widely known to call him, by his former name Cassius Clay, as an Uncle Tom, calling him the rabbit. Although Ali clearly had the better of Patterson, who appeared injured during the fight, the match lasted 12 rounds before being called on a technical knockout. Patterson later said he had strained his sacroi-like. Ali was criticized in the sports media for appearing to have toyed with Patterson during the fight. Patterson biographer W. K. Stratton claims that the conflict between Ali and Patterson was not genuine but, but was staged to increase ticket sales and the closed-circuit viewing audience, with both men complicit in the theatrics. Stratton also cites an interview by Howard Cosell in which Ali explained that rather than toying with Patterson, he refrained from knocking him out after it became apparent Patterson was injured. Patterson later said that he had never been hit by punches as soft as Ali's. Stratton states that Ali arranged the second fight, in 1972, with the financially struggling Patterson to help the former champion earn enough money to pay a debt to the IRS. Chapter 2 Section 2 Subsection 4 Main Bout After the Patterson fight, Ali founded his own promotion company, Main Bout. The company mainly handled Ali's boxing promotions and pay-per-view closed-circuit television broadcasts. The company's stockholders were mainly fellow Nation of Islam members, along with several others, including Bob Arum. Ali and then WBA heavyweight champion boxer Ernie Terrell had agreed to meet for a bout in Chicago on March 29, 1966. But in February Ali was reclassified by the Louisville Draft Board as 1A from 1Y, and he indicated that he would refuse to serve, commenting to the press, I ain't got nothing against no Viet Cong, no Viet Cong never called me nigger. Amidst the media and public outcry over Ali's stance, the Illinois Athletic Commission refused to sanction the fight, citing technicalities. Instead, Ali traveled to Canada and Europe and won championship bouts against George Chuvalo, Henry Cooper, Brian London, and Carl Mieldenberger. Ali returned to the United States to fight Cleveland Williams in the Houston Astrodome on November 14, 1966. The bout drew a record breaking indoor crowd of 35,460 people. Williams had once been considered among the hardest punches in the heavyweight division, but in 1964 he had been shot at point-blank range by a Texas policeman, resulting in the loss of one kidney and 3.0 meters of his small intestine. Ali dominated Williams, winning a third-round technical knockout in what some consider the finest performance of his career. Ali fought Terrell in Houston on February 6, 1967. Terrell, who was unbeaten in five years and had defeated many of the boxers Ali had faced, was billed as Ali's toughest opponent since Liston, he was big, strong and had a three-inch reach advantage over Ali. During the lead-up to the bout, Terrell repeatedly called Ali Clay, much to Ali's annoyance. The two almost came to blows over the name issue in a pre-fight interview with Howard Cosell. Ali seemed intent on humiliating Terrell. I want to torture him, 
he said. A clean knockout is too good for him. The fight was close until the seventh round, when Ali bloodied Terrell and almost knocked him out. In the eighth round, Ali taunted Terrell, hitting him with jabs and shouting between punches, What's my name, Uncle Tom, what's my name? Ali won a unanimous 15-round decision. Terrell claimed that early in the fight Ali deliberately thumbed him in the eye, forcing him to fight half-blind, and then, in a clinch, rubbed the wounded eye against the ropes. Because of Ali's apparent intent to prolong the fight to inflict maximum punishment, critics described the bout as one of the ugliest boxing fights. Tex Maule later wrote, It was a wonderful demonstration of boxing skill, and a barbarous display of cruelty. Ali denied the accusations of cruelty but, for Ali's critics, the fight provided more evidence of his arrogance. After Ali's title defense against Zora Folly on March 22, he was stripped of his title due to his refusal to be drafted to army service. His boxing license was also suspended by the state of New York. He was convicted of draft evasion on June 20 and sentenced to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. He paid a bond and remained free while the verdict was being appealed. Chapter 3 Vietnam War and Resistance to the Draft Ali registered for conscription in the United States military on his 18th birthday, and was listed as 1A in 1962. In 1964, he was reclassified as Class 1Y after he failed the U.S. Armed Forces qualifying test because his writing and spelling skills were substandard, due to his dyslexia. By early 1966, the Army lowered its standards to permit soldiers above the 15th percentile and Ali was again classified as 1A. This classification meant he was now eligible for the draft and induction into the U.S. Army at a time when the U.S. was involved in the Vietnam War, a war which put him further at odds with the white establishment. When notified of this status, Ali declared that he would refuse to serve in the Army and publicly considered himself a conscientious objector. Ali stated, War is against the teachings of the Quran. I'm not trying to dodge the draft. We are not supposed to take part in no wars unless declared by Allah or the Messenger. We don't take part in Christian wars or wars of any unbelievers. He also said we are not to be the aggressor but we will defend ourselves if attacked. He stated, Man, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. Ali elaborated, why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and, and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? Ali antagonized the white establishment in 1966 by refusing to be drafted into the U.S. military, citing his religious beliefs and opposition to American involvement in the Vietnam War. On April 28, 1967, Ali appeared in Houston for his scheduled induction into the U.S. Armed Forces, but he refused three times to step forward when his name was called. An officer warned him that he was committing a felony punishable by five years in prison and a fine of $10,000. Once more, Ali refused to budge when his name was called, and he was arrested. Later that same day, the New York State Athletic Commission suspended his boxing license and stripped him of his title. Other boxing commissions followed suit. Ali remained unable to obtain a license to box in any state for over three years. On June 4, 1967, in a first for sports professionals, a group of high-profile African-American athletes assembled at the Negro Industrial Economic Union in Cleveland for a Muhammad Ali summit. The meeting was organized by Jim Brown for his peers to question Ali about the seriousness of his convictions, and to decide whether to support him, which they ultimately did. At the trial on June 20, 1967, the jury found Ali guilty after only 21 minutes of deliberation of the criminal offense of violating the selective service laws by refusing to be drafted. After a court of appeals upheld the conviction, the case was reviewed by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1971. Ali remained free in the years between the appellate court decision and the Supreme Court ruling. As public opinion began turning people against the war and the civil rights movement continued to gather momentum, 
Ali became a popular speaker at colleges and universities across the country, this itinerary was rare if not unprecedented for a prize fighter. At Howard University, for example, he gave his popular Black is Best speech to 4,000 cheering students and community intellectuals, after he was invited to speak by sociology professor Nathan Hare on behalf of the Black Power Committee, a student protest group plot on June 28, 1971, the Supreme Court of the United States in Clay v. United States overturned Ali's conviction by a unanimous 8-0 decision. The decision was not based on, nor did it address, the merits of Ali's claims per se. Rather, the court held that since the appeal board gave no reason for the denial of a conscientious objector exemption to Ali, that it was therefore impossible to determine which of the three basic tests for conscientious objector status the appeal board relied on, and Ali's conviction must be reversed. Chapter 3 Section 1, Impact of Ali's Draft Refusal Ali's example inspired many black Americans and others. However, initially when he refused induction, he became arguably the most hated man in the country and received many death threats. People who supported Ali during this time were also threatened, including sports journalist Jerry Eisenberg, whose columns defended Ali's decision not to serve. He wrote, Bomb threats emptied our office, making the staff stand out in the snow. My car windshield was smashed with a sledgehammer. The New York Times columnist William Roden wrote, Ali's actions changed my standard of what constituted an athlete's greatness. Possessing a killer jump shot or the ability to stop on a dime was no longer enough. What were you doing for the liberation of your people? What were you doing to help your country live up to the covenant of its founding principles? Recalling Ali's anti-war position, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said, I remember the teachers at my high school didn't like Ali because he was so anti-establishment, and he kind of thumbed his nose at authority and got away with it. The fact that he was proud to be a black man and that he had so much talent, made some people think that he was dangerous. But for those very reasons I enjoyed him. Civil rights figures came to believe that Ali had an energizing effect on the freedom movement as a whole. Al Sharpton spoke of his bravery at a time when there was still widespread support for the Vietnam War. For the heavyweight champion of the world, who had achieved the highest level of athletic celebrity, to put all of that on the line, the money, the ability to get endorsements, to sacrifice all of that for a cause, gave a whole sense of legitimacy to the movement and the causes with young people that nothing else could have done. Even those who were assassinated, certainly lost their lives, but they didn't voluntarily do that. He knew he was going to jail and did it anyway. That's another level of leadership and sacrifice. Ali was honored with the annual Martin Luther King Award in 1970 by civil rights leader Ralph Abernathy, who called him a living example of soul power, the march on Washington in two fists. Coretta Scott King added that Ali was a champion of justice and peace and unity. In speaking of the cost on Ali's career of his refusal to be drafted, his trainer Angelo Dundee said, one thing must be taken into account when talking about Ali, he was robbed of his best years, his prime years. Bob Arum did not support Ali's choice at the time. More recently, Arum stated that when I look back at his life, and I was blessed to call him a friend and spent a lot of time with him, it's hard for me to talk about his exploits in boxing because as great as they were they paled in comparison to the impact that he had on the world, and he did what he thought was right. And it turned out he was right, and I was wrong. Ali's resistance to the draft was covered in the 2013 documentary The Trials of Muhammad Ali. Chapter 3 Section 2, NSA and FBI Monitoring of Ali's Communications in a secret operation codenamed Minaret, the National Security Agency intercepted the communications of leading Americans, including Ali, Senators Frank Church, and Howard Baker, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., prominent U.S. journalists, and others who criticized the U.S. war in Vietnam. A review by the NSA of the Minaret program concluded that it was disreputable if not outright illegal. In 1971, his fight of the century with Fraser was used by an activist group, the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI, to pull off a burglary at an FBI office in Pennsylvania, 
the anticipation for the fight was unlike anything else, so they believed the security would also be focused on the fight. This raid exposed the COINTELPRO operations that included illegal spying on activists involved with the civil rights and anti-war movements. One of the COINTELPRO targets was Ali, and their activities included the FBI gaining access to his records as far back as elementary school, one such record mentioned him loving art as a child. Chapter 4, Exile and Comeback In March 1966, Ali refused to be inducted into the armed forces. He was systematically denied a boxing license in every state, and stripped of his passport. As a result, he did not fight from March 1967 to October 1970, from ages 25 to almost 29, as his case worked its way through the appeals process before his conviction was overturned in 1971. Chapter 4 Section 1, Protesting While Exiled During this time of inactivity, as opposition to the Vietnam War began to grow and Ali's stance gained sympathy, he spoke at colleges across the nation, criticizing the Vietnam War and advocating African-American pride and racial justice. Ali based himself in Chicago. According to most close to him, his Chicago years were formative. At the time, Ali was widely condemned by the American media, with fears that his actions could potentially lead to mass civil disobedience. Despite this, Ebony magazine noted in the late 1960s that Ali's popularity had increased during this time, especially among black people. Chapter 4 Section 2 The Super Fight while banned from sanctioned bouts, Ali settled a $1 million lawsuit against radio producer Murray Wunner by accepting $10,000 to appear in a privately staged fantasy fight against retired champion Rocky Marciano. In 1969 the boxers were filmed sparring for about 75 one-minute rounds, they produced several potential outcomes. A computer program purportedly determined the winner, based on data about the fighters, along with the opinions of approximately 250 boxing experts. Edited versions of the bout were shown in movie theaters in 1970. In the US version Ali lost in a simulated 13th round knockout, but in the European version Marciano lost due to cuts, also simulated. Ali suggested that prejudice determined his defeat in the US version. He was reported to jokingly say, that computer was made in Alabama. Chapter 5, Return to Prize Fighting On August 11, 1970, with his case still in appeal, Ali was granted a license to box by the City of Atlanta Athletic Commission. Leroy Johnson, Jesse Hill Jr. and Harry Pett had used their local political influence and set up the company House of Sports to organize the fight, underlining the influential power of Georgia's black politics in Ali's comeback. Ali's first return bout was against Jerry Quarry on October 26, resulting in a win after three rounds after Quarry was cut. A month earlier, a victory in federal court forced the New York State Boxing Commission to reinstate Ali's license. He fought Oscar Bonavena at Madison Square Garden in December, an uninspired performance that ended in a dramatic technical knockout of Bonavena in the 15th round. The win left Ali as a top contender against heavyweight champion Joe Fraser. Chapter 5 Section 1, First Fight Against Joe Fraser Ali and Fraser's first fight, held at the Garden on March 8, 1971, was nicknamed the Fight of the Century, due to the tremendous excitement surrounding a bout between two undefeated fighters, each with a legitimate claim to be heavyweight champion. Veteran U.S. boxing writer John Condon called it the greatest event I've ever worked on in my life. The bout was broadcast to 36 countries, promoters granted 760 press passes. Adding to the atmosphere were the considerable pre fight theatrics and name calling. Before the fight, Fraser called Ali, Cassius Clay, this angered Ali and he portrayed Fraser as a dumb tool of the white establishment. Fraser is too ugly to be champ. Ali said. Fraser is too dumb to be champ. Ali also frequently called Fraser an Uncle Tom. Dave Wolf, who worked in Fraser's camp, recalled that, Ali was saying the only people rooting for Joe Fraser are white people in suits, Alabama sheriffs, and members of the Ku Klux Klan. 
I'm fighting for the little man in the ghetto. Joe was sitting there, smashing his fist into the palm of his hand, saying, what the fuck does he know about the ghetto? Ali began training at a farm near Reading, Pennsylvania, in 1971 and, finding the country setting to his liking, sought to develop a real training camp in the countryside. He found a five-acre site on a Pennsylvania country road in the village of Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. On this site, Ali carved out what was to become his training camp, where he trained for all his fights from 1972 to the end of his career in 1981. The Monday night fight lived up to its billing. In a preview of their two other fights, a crouching, bobbing and weaving Fraser constantly pressured Ali, getting hit regularly by Ali jabs and combinations, but relentlessly attacking and scoring repeatedly, especially to Ali's body. The fight was even in the early rounds, but Ali was taking more punishment than ever in his career. On several occasions in the early rounds he played to the crowd and shook his head no after he was hit. In the later rounds, in what was the first appearance of the rope-a-dope strategy Ali leaned against the ropes and absorbed punishment from Fraser, hoping to tire him. In the eleventh round, Fraser connected with a left hook that wobbled Ali, but because it appeared that Ali might be clowning as he staggered backwards across the ring, Fraser hesitated to press his advantage, fearing an Ali counterattack. In the final round, Fraser knocked Ali down with a vicious left hook, which referee Arthur Mercanti said was as hard as a man can be hit. Ali was back on his feet in three seconds. Nevertheless, Ali lost by unanimous decision, his first professional defeat. Chapter 5 Section 2 Chamberlain Challenge and Ellis Fight In 1971, basketball star Wilt Chamberlain challenged Ali to a fight, and a bout was scheduled for July 26. Although the 7-foot 2-inch tall Chamberlain had formidable physical advantages over Ali, weighing 60 pounds more and able to reach 14 inches further, Ali was able to influence Chamberlain into calling off the bout by taunting him with calls of timber and the tree will fall during a shared interview. These statements of confidence unsettled his taller opponent, whom Los Angeles Lakers owner Jack, Kent Cook had offered a record-setting contract, conditional on Chamberlain agreeing to abandon what Cook termed this boxing foolishness, and he did exactly that. To replace Ali's opponent, promoter Bob Arum quickly booked a former sparring partner of Ali's, Jimmy Ellis, who was a childhood friend from Louisville, Kentucky, to fight him. Chapter 5 Section 3 – After His Loss Chapter 5 Section 3 – Subsection 2 – Fights Against Quarry, Patterson, Foster, and Norton After the loss to Fraser, Ali fought Jerry Quarry, had a second bout with Floyd Patterson and faced Bob Foster in 1972, winning a total of six fights that year. In 1973, Ken Norton broke Ali's jaw while giving him the second loss of his career. After initially considering retirement, Ali won a controversial decision against Norton in their second bout. This led to a rematch with Joe Fraser at Madison Square Garden on January 28, 1974. Fraser had recently lost his title to George Foreman. Chapter 5 Section 3 Subsection 3 Second Fight Against Joe Fraser Ali was strong in the early rounds of the fight, and staggered Fraser in the second round. Referee Tony Perez mistakenly thought he heard the bell ending the round and stepped between the two fighters as Ali was pressing his attack, giving Fraser time to recover. However, Fraser came on in the middle rounds, snapping Ali's head in round seven and driving him to the ropes at the end of round eight. The last four rounds saw round-to-round -round shifts in momentum between the two fighters. Throughout most of the bout, however, Ali was able to circle away from Frazier's dangerous left hook and to tie Fraser up when he was cornered, the latter a tactic that Frazier's camp complained of bitterly. Judges awarded Ali a unanimous decision. Chapter 5 Section 4 – World Heavyweight Champion Chapter 5 Section 4 Subsection 2 The Rumble in the Jungle The defeat of Fraser set the stage for a title fight against heavyweight champion George Foreman in Kinshasa, Zaire, on October 30, 1974, about nicknamed The Rumble in the Jungle. 
Foreman was considered one of the hardest punches in heavyweight history. In assessing the fight, analysts pointed out that Joe Fraser and Ken Norton, who had given Ali four tough battles and won two of them, had both been devastated by Foreman in second-round knockouts. Ali was 32 years old, and had clearly lost speed and reflexes since his twenties. Contrary to his later persona, Foreman was at the time a brooding and intimidating presence. Almost no one associated with the sport, not even Ali's longtime supporter Howard Cosell, gave the former champion a chance of winning. As usual, Ali was confident and colorful before the fight. He told interviewer David Frost, If you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I whoop Foreman's behind. He told the press, I've done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator, I done tussled with a whale, handcuffed lightning, thrown thunder in jail, only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick, I'm so mean I make medicine sick. Ali was wildly popular in Zaire, with crowds chanting Ali, Bumaye wherever he went. Ali opened the fight moving and scoring with right crosses to Foreman's head. Then, beginning in the second round, and to the consternation of his corner, Ali retreated to the ropes and invited Foreman to hit him while covering up, clinching and counter-punching, all while verbally taunting Foreman. The move, which would later become known as the Roper Dope, so violated conventional boxing wisdom, letting one of the hardest hitters in boxing strike at will, that at ringside writer George Plimpton thought the fight had to be fixed. Foreman, increasingly angered, threw punches that were deflected and did not land squarely. Midway through the fight, as Foreman began tiring, Ali countered more frequently and effectively with punches and flurries, which electrified the pro Ali crowd. In the eighth round, Ali dropped an exhausted Foreman with a combination at center ring, Foreman failed to make the count. Against the odds, and amidst pandemonium in the ring, Ali had regained the title by knockout. Reflecting on the fight, George Foreman later said, I thought Ali was just one more knockout victim until, about the seventh round, I hit him hard to the jaw and he held me and whispered in my ear, that all you got, George. I realized that this ain't what I thought it was. It was a major upset victory, after Ali came in as a 4-1 to one underdog against the previously unbeaten, heavy-hitting foreman. The fight became famous for Ali's introduction of the Roper Dope tactic. The fight was watched by a record-estimated television audience of 1 billion viewers worldwide. It was the world's most watched live television broadcast at the time. Chapter 5 Section 4 Subsection 3 Fights Against Wepner, Lyle, and Buna Ali's next opponents included Chuck Wepner, Ron Lyle, and Joe Buna. Wepner, a journeyman known as the Bayonne Bleeder, stunned Ali with a knockdown in the ninth round, Ali would later say he tripped on Wepner's foot. It was about that would inspire Sylvester Stallone to create the acclaimed film, Rocky. Chapter 5 Section 4 Subsection 4 Third Fight Against Joe Fraser Ali then agreed to a third match with Joe Fraser in Manila. The bout, known as the Thriller in Manila, was held on October 1, 1975, in temperatures approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In the first rounds, Ali was aggressive, moving and exchanging blows with Fraser. However, Ali soon appeared to tire and adopted the rope-a-dope strategy, frequently resorting to clinches. During this part of the bout Ali did some effective counter-punching, but for the most part absorbed, punishment from a relentlessly attacking Fraser. In the twelfth round, Fraser began to tire, and Ali scored several sharp blows that closed Fraser's left eye and opened a cut over his right eye. With Fraser's vision now diminished, Ali dominated the thirteenth and fourteenth rounds, at times conducting what boxing historian Mike Silver called, target practice on Fraser's head. The fight was stopped when Fraser's trainer, Eddie Futch, refused to allow Fraser to answer the bell for the fifteenth and final round, despite Fraser's protests. Fraser's eyes were both swollen shut. Ali, in his corner, winner by TKO, slumped on his stool, clearly spent. 
An ailing Ali said afterwards that the fight was the closest thing to dying that I know, and, when later asked if he had viewed the fight on videotape, reportedly said, why would I want to go back and see hell? After the fight he cited Fraser as the greatest fighter of all times next to me. After the third fight with Fraser, Ali considered retirement. He said, I'm sore all over. My arms, my face, my sides all ache. I'm so, so tired. There is a great possibility that I will retire. You might have seen the last of me. I want to sit back and count my money, live in my house and my farm, work for my people and concentrate on my family. Chapter 5 Section 5 Later Career Following the Manila bout, Ali fought Jean-Pierre Koopman, Jimmy Young, and Richard Dunn, winning the last by knockout. The punch used to knock Dunn out was taught to Ali by Taekwondo Grandmaster Jun Ri. Ri called that punch the acupunch, he learned it from Bruce Lee. The Dunn fight was the last time Ali would knock down an opponent in his boxing career. Ali fought Ken Norton for the third time in September 1976. The bout, which was held at Yankee Stadium, resulted in Ali winning a heavily contested decision that was loudly booed by the audience. Afterwards, he announced he was retiring from boxing to practice his faith, having converted to Sunni Islam after falling out with the Nation of Islam the previous year. After returning to beat Alfredo Evangelista in May 1977, Ali struggled in his next fight against Ernie Shavers that September, getting pummeled a few times by punches to the head. Ali won the fight by another unanimous decision, but the bout caused his longtime doctor Ferdy Pacheco to quit after he was rebuffed for telling Ali he should retire. Pacheco was quoted as saying, The New York State Athletic Commission gave me a report that showed Ali's kidneys were falling apart. I wrote to Angelo Dundee, Ali's trainer, his wife and Ali himself. I got nothing back in response. That's when I decided enough is enough. In February 1978, Ali faced Leon Spinks at the Hilton Hotel in Las Vegas. At the time, Spinks had only seven professional fights to his credit, and had recently fought a draw with journeyman Scott Ledoux. Ali sparred less than two dozen rounds in preparation for the fight, and was seriously out of shape by the opening bell. He lost the title by split decision. A rematch occurred in September at the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. 70,000 people attended the bout and paid a total of $6 million admission, making it the largest live gate in boxing history at that time. Ali won a unanimous decision in an uninspiring fight, with referee Lucien Joubert scoring rounds 10-4, Judge Ernie Kojo 10-4, and Judge Herman Pries 11-4. This made Ali the first heavyweight champion to win the belt three times. Following this win, on July 27, 1979, Ali announced his retirement from boxing. His retirement was short lived, however, Ali announced his comeback to face Larry Holmes for the WBC belt in an attempt to win the heavyweight championship an unprecedented fourth time. The fight was largely motivated by Ali's need for money. Boxing writer Richie Jayaketty said, Larry didn't want to fight Ali. He knew Ali had nothing left, he knew it would be a horror. It was around this time that Ali started struggling with vocal stutters and trembling hands. The Nevada Athletic Commission ordered that he undergo a complete physical in Las Vegas before being allowed to fight again. Ali chose instead to check into the Mayo Clinic, who declared him fit to fight. Their opinion was accepted by the NAC on July 31, 1980, paving the way for Ali's return to the ring. The fight took place on October 2, 1980, in Las Vegas Valley, with Holmes easily dominating Ali, who was weakened from thyroid medication he had taken to lose weight. Jayaketty called the fight awful, the worst sports event I ever had to cover. Actor Sylvester Stallone was at ringside and said that it was like watching an autopsy on a man who is still alive. After the tenth round, Angelo Dundee told the referee to stop the fight, making it the only time that Ali ever lost by stoppage. The Holmes fight is said to have contributed to Ali's Parkinson's syndrome. Despite pleas to definitively retire, Ali fought one last time on December 11, 1981, in Nassau, 
Bahamas, against Trevor Burbick, losing a 10-round decision. By the end of his boxing career Ali had absorbed an estimated 200,000 hits. Chapter 6, Exhibition Bouts Ali boxed both well-known boxers and celebrities from other walks of life, including Michael Dokes, Antonio Inoki, Lyle Olzado, Dave Semenko, and the famous Puerto Rican comedian José Miguel Agrelot. Chapter 6 Section 1, Ali vs. Inoki On June 26, 1976, Ali participated in an exhibition bout in Tokyo against Japanese professional wrestler and martial artist Antonio Inoki. Ali was only able to land two jabs while Inoki's kicks caused two blood clots and an infection that almost resulted in Ali's leg being amputated, as a result of Ali's team insisting on rules restricting Inoki's ability to wrestle. The match was not scripted and ultimately declared a draw. After Ali's death, the New York Times declared it his least memorable fight. Most boxing commentators at the time viewed the fight negatively and hoped it would be forgotten as some considered it a 15-round farce. Today it is considered by some to be one of Ali's most influential fights and CBS Sports said the attention the mixed style bout received foretold the arrival of standardized MMA years later. After the fight, Ali and Inoki became friends. Chapter 6, Section 2, Ali vs. Olzado in 1979, Ali fought an exhibition match against NFL player Lyle Olzado. The fight went eight rounds and was declared a draw. Chapter 6 Section 3, Ali vs. Semenko Ali fought NHL player, Dave Semenko in an exhibition on June 12, 1983. The match was officially a draw after going three rounds, but the Associated Press reported Ali was not seriously trying and was just toying with Semenko. Chapter 7, Personal Life Chapter 7 Section 1, Marriages and Children Ali was married four times and had seven daughters and two sons. Ali was introduced to cocktail waitress Sorn Giaroi by Herbert Muhammad and asked her to marry him after their first date. They married approximately one month later on August 14, 1964. They quarreled over Sonji's refusal to join the Nation of Islam. According to Ali, she wouldn't do what she was supposed to do. She wore lipstick, she went into bars, she dressed in clothes that were revealing and didn't look right. The marriage was childless and they divorced on January 10, 1966. Just before the divorce was finalized, Ali sent Sonji a note, you traded heaven for hell, baby. Ali's brother Rahman said that she was Ali's only true love and the Nation of Islam made Ali divorce her and Ali never got over it. On August 17, 1967, Ali married Belinda Boyd. Born into a Chicago family that had converted to the Nation of Islam, she later changed her name to Khalila Ali, though she was still called Belinda by old friends and family. They had four children, author and rapper Miriam May May, twins Jamila and Rashida, who married Robert Walsh and has a son, Biogio Ali, born in 1998, and Muhammad Ali Jr. Rashida's son Nico is a professional boxer. Ali was a resident of Cherry Hill, New Jersey in the early 1970s. At age 32 in 1974, Ali began an extramarital relationship with 16-year-old Wanda Bolton with whom he fathered another daughter, Kalia. While still married to Belinda, Ali married Aisha in an Islamic ceremony that was not legally recognized. According to Kalia, Aisha and her mother lived at Ali's Deer Lake training camp alongside Belinda and her children. In January 1985, Aisha sued Ali for unpaid palimony. The case was settled when Ali agreed to set up a $200,000 trust fund for Kalia. In 2001 Kalia was quoted as saying she believed her father viewed her as a mistake. He had another daughter, Mia, from an extramarital relationship with Patricia Harville. By the summer of 1977, his second marriage ended due to Ali's repeated infidelity, and he had married actress and model Veronica Porch. At the time of their marriage, they had a daughter, Hannah, and Veronica was pregnant with their second child. 
Their second daughter, Layla Ali, was born in December 1977. By 1986, Ali and Porch were divorced due to Ali's continuous infidelity. Porch said of Ali's infidelity, it was too much temptation for him, with women who threw themselves at him, it didn't mean anything. He didn't have affairs, he had one-night stands. I knew beyond a doubt there were no feelings involved. It was so obvious, it was easy to forgive him. On November 19, 1986, Ali married Yolanda Lonnie Williams. Lonnie first met Ali at the age of six when her family moved to Louisville in 1963. In 1982, she became Ali's primary caregiver and in return, he paid for her to attend graduate school at UCLA. Together they adopted a son, Assad Amin, when Assad was five months old. In 1992, Lonnie incorporated Greatest of All Time Incorporated to consolidate and license his intellectual properties for commercial purposes. She served as the vice president and treasurer until the sale of the company in 2006. Kirsty Mensah Ali claims she is Ali's biological daughter with Barbara Mensah, with whom he allegedly had a 20 year relationship, citing photographs and a paternity test conducted in 1988. She said he accepted responsibility and took care of her, but all contacts with him were cut off after he married his fourth wife Lonnie. Kirsty says she has a relationship with his other children. After his death she again made passionate appeals to be allowed to mourn at his funeral. In 2010, Osman Williams came forward claiming to be Ali's biological son. His mother Tamika Williams launched a $3 million lawsuit against Ali in 1981 for sexual assault, claiming that she had started a sexual relationship with him when she was 12, and that her son Osman was fathered by Ali. She further alleged that Ali had originally supported her and her son financially, but stopped doing so after four years. The case went on until 1986 and was eventually thrown out as her allegations were deemed to be barred by the statute of limitations. According to Veronica, Ali admitted to the affair with Williams, but did not believe Osman was his son which Veronica supported by saying everybody in the camp was going with that girl. Ali biographer and friend Thomas Hauser has said this claim was of questionable veracity. Ali then lived in Scottsdale, Arizona with Lonnie. In January 2007, it was reported that they had put their home in Berrien Springs, Michigan, which they had bought in 1975, up for sale and had purchased a home in eastern Jefferson County, Kentucky for $1,875,000. Both homes were subsequently sold after Ali's death with Lonnie living in their remaining home in Paradise Valley, Arizona. Lonnie converted to Islam from Catholicism in her late twenties. In an interview in 1974, Ali said, If they say stand and salute the flag I do that out of respect, because I'm in the country. Ali would later say, If America was in trouble and real war came, I'd be on the front line if we had been attacked. But I could see that wasn't right. He also said, black men would go over there and fight, but when they came home, they couldn't even be served a hamburger. Ali's daughter Layla was a professional boxer from 1999 until 2007, despite her father's previous opposition to women's boxing. In 1978, he said women are not made to be hit in the breast, and face like that. Ali still attended a number of his daughter's fights and later admitted to Layla he was wrong. Ali's daughter Hannah, is married to Bellator middleweight fighter Kevin Casey. Hannah wrote about her father, his love for people was extraordinary. I would get home from school to find homeless families, sleeping in our guest room. He'd see them on the street, pile them into his Rolls Royce and bring them home. He'd buy them clothes, take them to hotels and pay the bills for months in advance. She also said celebrities like Michael Jackson and Clint Eastwood would often visit Ali. After Ali met a lesbian couple who were fans of his in 1997, he smiled and said to his friend Hauser, they look like they're happy together. Hauser wrote about the story, the thought that Liz and Roz were happy pleased Muhammad. Ali wanted people to be happy. Chapter 7 Section 2, Religion and Beliefs 
Chapter 7 Section 2 Subsection 2 Affiliation with the Nation of Islam Ali said that he first heard of the Nation of Islam when he was fighting in the Golden Gloves Tournament in Chicago in 1959, and attended his first Nation of Islam meeting in 1961. He continued to attend meetings, although keeping his involvement hidden from the public. In 1962, Clay met Malcolm X, who soon became his spiritual, and political mentor. By the time of the first list and fight, Nation of Islam members, including Malcolm X, were visible in his entourage. This led to a story in the Miami Herald just before the fight disclosing that Clay had joined the Nation of Islam, which nearly caused the bout to be cancelled. The article quoted Cassius Clay Sr. as saying that his son had joined the black Muslims when he was 18. In fact, Clay was initially refused entry to the Nation of Islam due to his boxing career. However, after he won the championship from Liston in 1964, the Nation of Islam was more receptive and agreed to publicize his membership. Shortly afterwards on March 6, Elijah Muhammad gave a radio address that Clay would be renamed Muhammad Ali. Around that time Ali moved to the south side of Chicago and lived in a series of houses, always near the Nation of Islam's Mosque Maryam or Elijah Muhammad's residence. He stayed in Chicago for about 12 years. Only a few journalists, most notably Howard Cosell, accepted the new name at that time. Ali stated that his earlier name was a slave name, and a white man's name and added that I didn't choose it and I don't want it. The person he was named after was a white man, and emancipationist, who released slaves. Ali explained in his autobiography after studying his works, while Clay may have gotten rid of his slaves, he held on to white supremacy. In truth, Cassius Clay's attachment to slavery went farther than Ali knew. In spite of his abolitionist fervor, Clay owned more slaves in 1865, when the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution finally forbade its practice, than he had inherited from his father 37 years earlier. Not afraid to antagonize the white establishment, Ali stated, I am America. I am the part you won't recognize. But get used to me. Black, confident, cocky, my name, not yours, my religion, not yours, my goals, my own, get used to me. Ali's friendship with Malcolm X ended as Malcolm split with the Nation of Islam a couple of weeks after Ali joined, and Ali remained with the Nation of Islam. Ali later said that turning his back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes he regretted most in his life. Aligning himself with the Nation of Islam, its leader Elijah Muhammad, and a narrative that labeled the white race as the perpetrator of genocide against African Americans made Ali a target of public condemnation. The Nation of Islam was widely viewed by whites and some African Americans as a black separatist hate religion with a propensity toward violence. Ali had few qualms about using his influential voice to speak Nation of Islam doctrine. In a press conference articulating his opposition to the Vietnam War, Ali stated, My enemy is the white people, not Viet Cong or Chinese or Japanese. In relation to integration, he said, We who follow the teachings of Elijah Muhammad don't want to be forced to integrate. Integration is wrong. We don't want to live with the white man, that's all. Further articulating his opposition to integration, he told members of the KKK at a Klan rally in 1975 that black people should marry their own women. Blue birds are blue birds, red birds are red birds, pigeons with pigeons, eagles with eagles, God did not make no mistake. Writer Jerry Eisenberg once noted that, the nation became Ali's family, and Elijah Muhammad became his father. But there is an irony to the fact that while the nation branded white people as devils, Ali had more white colleagues than most African American people did at that time in America, and continued to have them throughout his career. Chapter 7 Section 2 Subsection 3 Conversion to Sunni Slash Sufi Islam In Hauser's biography Muhammad Ali, His Life and Times, Ali says that although he's not a Christian as he thinks the idea of God having a son sounds wrong and doesn't make sense to him, as he believes, God don't beget, man begets. He still believes that even good Christians or good Jews can receive God's blessing and enter heaven as he stated, 
God created all people, no matter what their religion. He also stated, if you're against someone because he's a Muslim that's wrong. If you're against someone because he's a Christian or a Jew, that's wrong. In a 2004 autobiography, Ali attributed his conversion to mainstream Sunni Islam to Warth Dean Muhammad, who assumed leadership of the Nation of Islam upon the death of his father Elijah Muhammad, and persuaded the nation's followers to become adherents of Sunni Islam. He said some people didn't like the change and stuck to Elijah's teachings, but he admired it and so left Elijah's teachings and became a follower of Sunni Islam. Ali had gone on the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca in 1972, which inspired him in a similar manner to Malcolm X meeting people of different colors from all over the world giving him a different outlook and greater spiritual awareness. In 1977, he said that, after he retired, he would dedicate the rest of his life to getting ready to meet God by helping people, charitable causes, uniting people and helping to make peace. He went on another Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca in 1988, dot after the September 11 attacks in 2001, he stated that Islam is a religion of peace and does not promote terrorism or killing people, and that he was angry that the world sees a certain group of Islam followers who caused this destruction, but they are not real Muslims. They are racist fanatics who call themselves Muslims. In December 2015, he stated that true Muslims know that the ruthless violence of so-called Islamic jihadists goes against the very tenets of our religion, that we as Muslims have to stand up to those who use Islam to advance their own personal agenda, and that political leaders should use their position to bring understanding about the religion of Islam, and clarify that these misguided murderers have perverted people's views on what Islam really is. In later life after retiring from boxing, Ali became a student of the Quran and a devout Muslim. He also developed an interest in Sufism, which he referenced in his autobiography, The Soul of a Butterfly. According to Ali's daughter, Hannah Yasmin Ali, who co-authored The Soul of a Butterfly with him, Ali was attracted to Sufism after reading the books of Inayat Khan, which contain Sufi teachings. Muhammad Ali received guidance from Islamic scholars such as Grand Mufti of Syria Almaram Asi Sheikh Ahmed Kuftaro, Hisham Kabani, Imam Zaid Shakir, Hamza Yusuf, and Timothy J. Jonoti, who was at Ali's bedside during his last days and ensured that although his funeral was into faith, it was still in accordance with Islamic rites and rituals. Chapter 7 Section 3, Beatles Reunion Plan In 1976, inventor Alan Amron and businessman Joel Sacker partnered with Ali to promote the International Committee to Reunite the Beatles. They asked fans worldwide to contribute a dollar each. Ali said the idea was not to use the proceeds for profit, but to establish an international agency to help poor children. This is money to help people all over the world, he said. He added, I love the music. I used to train to their music, he said a reunion of the Beatles would make a lot of people happy. The former Beatles were indifferent to the plan, which elicited only a tepid response from the public. No reunion happened. Chapter 8, Entertainment Career Chapter 8 Section 1, Acting Ali had a cameo role in the 1962 film version of Requiem for a Heavyweight, and during his exile from boxing, he starred in the short-lived 1969 Broadway musical, Buck White. He also appeared in the documentary film Black Rodeo riding both a horse and a bull. His autobiography The Greatest, My Own Story, written with Richard Durham, was published in 1975. In 1977 the book was adapted into a film called The Greatest, in which Ali played himself and Ernest Borgnine played Angelo Dundee. The film Freedom Road, made in 1978, features Ali in a rare acting role as Gideon Jackson, a former slave and Union soldier in 1870s Virginia, who gets elected to the U.S. Senate and battles alongside former slaves and white sharecroppers to keep the land they have tended all their lives. Chapter 8 Section 2, Spoken Word Poetry and Rap Music Ali often used rhyme schemes and spoken word poetry, both for when he was trash-talking in boxing and as political poetry for his activism outside of boxing. He played a role in the shaping of the black poetic tradition, paving the way for the last poets in 1968, 
Gil Scott Heron in 1970, and the emergence of rap music in the 1970s. According to The Guardian, some have argued that Ali was the first rapper. In 1963, Ali released an album of spoken word music on Columbia Records titled, I Am The Greatest, and in 1964, he recorded a cover version of the rhythm and blues song Stand By Me. I Am The Greatest sold 500,000 copies, and has been identified as an early example of rap music in a precursor to hip-hop. It reached number 61 on the album chart and was nominated for a Grammy Award. He later received a second Grammy nomination, for Best Recording for Children, with his 1976 spoken word novelty record, The Adventures of Ali and His Gang vs. Mr. Tooth Decay. Ali was an influential figure in the world of hip-hop music. As a rhyming trickster, he was noted for his funky delivery, boasts, comical trash talk, and endless quotables. According to Rolling Stone, his freestyle skills and his rhymes, flow, and braggadocio would one day become typical of old-school MCs like Run DMC and LL Cool J, and his outsized ego foreshadowed the vainglorious excesses of Kanye West, while his Afrocentric consciousness and cutting honesty pointed forward to modern bards like Rakim, Nas, Jay-Z, and Kendrick Lamar. I've wrestled with alligators, I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and throw thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. Just last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. His hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. Now you see me, now you don't. George thinks he will, but I know he won't. Ali spoke like no man the world had seen before. So confident in what he said, fluent, smooth, creative, and intimidating. He was a boxer and an activist, but he also had a role in influencing what now dominated pop culture, hip-hop. In 2006, the documentary Ali Rap was produced by ESPN. Chuck D, a rapper for the band Public Enemy is the host. Other rappers narrated the documentary as well, including Dougie Fresh, Ludacris and Rakim who all spoke on Ali's behalf in the film. He has been cited as an inspiration by rappers such as LL Cool J, Public Enemy's Chuck D, Jay-Z, Eminem, Sean Combs, Slick Rick, Nas and MC Light. Ali has been referenced in a number of hip-hop songs, including Migos Fight Night, The Game's Jesus Peace, Nas The Message, the Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight, The Fuji's Ready or Not, EPMD's You're a Customer and Will Smith's Getting Jiggy With It. Chapter 8 Section 3, Professional Wrestling Ali was involved with professional wrestling at different times in his career. On June 1, 1976, as Ali was preparing for his bout with Inoki, he attended a match featuring Gorilla Monsoon. After the match was over, Ali removed his shirt and jacket and confronted professional wrestler Gorilla Monsoon in the ring after his match at a Worldwide Wrestling Federation show in Philadelphia Arena. After dodging a few punches, Monsoon put Ali in an airplane spin, and dumped him to the mat. Ali stumbled to the corner, where his associate Butch Lewis convinced him to walk away. On March 31, 1985, Ali was the special guest referee for the main event of the inaugural WrestleMania event. In 1995, Ali led a group of Japanese and American professional wrestlers, including his 1976 opponent Antonio Inoki and Ric Flair, on a sports diplomacy mission to North Korea. Ali was guest of honor at the record breaking collision in Korea, a wrestling event with the largest attendance of all time. Chapter 8, Section 4 Television Appearances Muhammad Ali's fights were some of the world's most watched television broadcasts, setting television viewership records. His most watched fights drew an estimated 1 to 2 billion viewers worldwide between 1974 and 1980, and were the world's most watched live television broadcasts at the time. Outside of fights, he made many other television appearances. The following table lists known viewership figures of his non fight television appearances. For television viewership figures of his fights, see Boxing Career of Muhammad Ali, Television Viewership. 
Chapter 8 Section 5, Art Ali was also an amateur artist and made dozens of drawings and paintings in the 1970s. In 1977, Rodney Hilton Brown, who owned an art gallery in NYC, asked Ali if he was interested in painting. Ali took him up on the offer and produced several paintings for him to sell. Brown is the author of Muhammad Ali, The Untold Story, Painter, Poet, and Prophet. In October 2021, 26 of his drawings and arts were placed on auction and sold for close to $1 million USD. Chapter 9, Later Years In 1984, Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's syndrome, which sometimes results from head trauma from violent physical activities such as boxing. Ali still remained active during this time, later participating as a guest referee at WrestleMania I. Chapter 9 Section 1 philanthropy, humanitarianism and politics. Ali was known for being a humanitarian and philanthropist. He focused on practicing his Islamic duty of charity and good deeds, donating millions to charity organizations and disadvantaged people of all religious backgrounds. It is estimated that Ali helped to feed more than 22 million people afflicted by hunger across the world. Early in his career, one of his main focuses was youth education. He spoke at several historically black colleges and universities about the importance of education, and became the largest single black donor to the United Negro College Fund in 1967 by way of a $10,000 donation. In late 1966, he also pledged to donate a total of $100,000 to the UNCF, and paid $4,500 per closed circuit installation at six HBCUs, so they could watch his fights. Ali began visiting Africa, starting in 1964 when he visited Nigeria and Ghana. In 1974, he visited a Palestinian refugee camp in southern Lebanon, where Ali declared support for the Palestinians' struggle to liberate their homeland. In 1978, following his loss to Spinks and before winning the rematch, Ali visited Bangladesh and received honorary citizenship there. The same year, he participated in the Longest Walk, a protest march in the United States in support of Native American rights, along with singer Stevie Wonder and actor Marlon Brando. In 1980, Ali was recruited by President Jimmy Carter for a diplomatic mission to Africa, in an effort to persuade a number of African governments to join the US led boycott of the Moscow Olympics. According to Ali biographer Thomas Hauser, at best, it was ill-conceived, at worst, a diplomatic disaster. The Tanzanian government was insulted that Carter, had sent an athlete to discuss a serious political issue. One official asked whether the United States would send Chris Evert to negotiate with London. Consequently, Ali was only received by the Youth and Culture Minister, rather than President Julius Nyerere. Ali was unable to explain why the African countries should join the U.S. boycott when it had failed to support the African boycott of the 1976 Olympics, and was unaware that the Soviet Union was sponsoring popular revolutionary movements in Africa. Ali conceded they didn't tell me about that in America, and complained that Carter had sent him around the world to take the whooping over American policies. The Nigerian government also rebuffed him and confirmed that they would be participating in the Moscow Games. Ali did, however, convince the government of Kenya to boycott the Olympics. On January 19, 1981, in Los Angeles, Ali talked a suicidal man down from jumping off a ninth floor ledge, an event that made national news. In 1984, Ali announced his support for the re election of United States President Ronald Reagan. When asked to elaborate on his endorsement of Reagan, Ali told reporters, he's keeping God in schools and that's enough. In 1985, he visited Israel to request the release of Muslim prisoners at Otlit detainee camp, which Israel declined at around 1987. The California Bicentennial Foundation for the U.S. Constitution selected Ali to personify the vitality of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. Ali rode on a float at the following year's Tournament of Roses Parade, launching the U.S. Constitution's 200th birthday commemoration. In 1988, during the First Intifada, Ali participated in a Chicago rally in support of Palestine. The same year, 
he visited Sudan to raise awareness about the plight of famine victims. According to Politico, Ali supported Orrin Hatch politically. In 1989, he participated in an Indian charity event with the Muslim Educational Society in Kori Code, Kerala, along with Bollywood actor Dilip Kumar. In 1990, Ali traveled to Iraq prior to the Gulf War, and met with Saddam Hussein in an attempt to negotiate the release of American hostages. Ali secured the release of the hostages, in exchange for promising Hussein that he would bring America an honest account of Iraq. Despite arranging the hostages' release, he received criticism from President George H. W. Bush and Joseph C. Wilson, the highest-ranking American diplomat in Baghdad. Ali cooperated with Thomas Hauser on a biography, Muhammad Ali, His Life and Times. The oral history was published in 1991. In 1994, Ali campaigned to the United States government to come to the aid of refugees afflicted by the Rwandan genocide, and to donate to organizations helping Rwandan refugees. In 1996, he lit the flame at the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. It was watched by an estimated 3.5 billion viewers worldwide. On November 17, 2002, Ali went to Afghanistan as the UN Messenger of Peace. He was in Kabul for a three-day goodwill mission as a special guest of the UN. On September 1, 2009, Ali visited Ennis, County Clare, Ireland, the home of his great-grandfather, Abe Grady, who emigrated to the US in the 1860s, eventually settling in Kentucky. On July 27, 2012, Ali was a titular bearer of the Olympic flag during the opening ceremonies of the 2012 Summer Olympics in London. He was helped to his feet by his wife Lonnie to stand before the flag due to his Parkinson's syndrome rendering him unable to carry it into the stadium. The same year, he was awarded the Philadelphia Liberty Medal in recognition of his lifelong efforts in activism, philanthropy and humanitarianism. Chapter 9 Section 2 Earnings By 1978, Ali's total fight purse earnings were estimated to be nearly $60 million, including an estimated $47.45 million grossed between 1970 and 1978. By 1980, his total fight purse earnings were estimated to be up to $70 million. In 1978, Ali revealed that he was broke and several news outlets reported his net worth to be an estimated $3.5 million. The press attributed his decline in wealth to several factors, including taxes consuming at least half of his income, management taking a third of his income, his lifestyle, and spending on family, charity and religious causes. In 2006, Ali sold his name and image for $50 million, after which Forbes estimated his net worth to be $55 million in 2006. Following his death in 2016, his fortune was estimated to be between $50 million and $80 million. Chapter 9 Section 3, Declining Health Ali's bout with Parkinson's syndrome led to a gradual decline in his health, though he was still active into the early years of the millennium, promoting his own biopic, Ali, in 2001. That year he also contributed an on-camera segment to The America, a tribute to Heroes Benefit concert. In 1998, Ali began working with actor Michael J. Fox, who has Parkinson's disease, to raise awareness and fund research for a cure. They made a joint appearance before Congress to push the case in 2002. In 2000, Ali worked with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Disease to raise awareness and encourage donations for research. In February 2013, Ali's brother Rahman Ali said Muhammad could no longer speak and could be dead within days. Ali's daughter May May Ali responded to the rumors stating that she had talked to him on the phone the morning of February 3rd and he was fine. On December 20, 2014, Ali was hospitalized for a mild case of pneumonia. Ali was once again hospitalized on January 15, 2015, for a urinary tract infection after being found unresponsive at a guest house in Scottsdale, Arizona. He was released the next day. Chapter 10, Death Ali was hospitalized in Scottsdale, Arizona, on June 2, 2016, 
with a respiratory illness. Though his condition was initially described as fair, it worsened, and he died the following day at the age of 74 from septic shock. Chapter 10 Section 1 News Coverage and Tributes Following Ali's death, he was the number one trending topic on Twitter for over 12 hours and on Facebook for several days. BT played their documentary Muhammad Ali, Made in Miami. ESPN played four hours of non-stop commercial-free coverage of Ali. News networks, such as ABC News, BBC, CNN, and Fox News, also covered him extensively. He was mourned globally, and a family spokesman said the family certainly believes that Muhammad was a citizen of the world, and they know that the world grieves with him. Politicians such as Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, David Cameron, and more paid tribute to Ali. Ali also received numerous tributes from the world of sports including Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, the Miami Marlins, LeBron James, Steph Curry and more. Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher stated, Muhammad Ali belongs to the world. But he only has one hometown? The day after Ali's death, the UFC paid tribute to Ali at their UFC 199 event in a lengthy video tribute package, crediting Ali for his accomplishments and inspiring multiple UFC champions. Chapter 10 Section 2 Memorial Ali's funeral had been pre-planned by himself and others for several years prior to his actual death. The services began in Louisville on June 9, 2016, with an Islamic Janazah prayer service at Freedom Hall on the grounds of the Kentucky Exposition Center. On June 10, 2016, the funeral procession passed through the streets of Louisville ending at Cave Hill Cemetery, where his body was interred during a private ceremony. A public memorial service for Ali at downtown Louisville's KFC Yum. Center was held during the afternoon of June 10. The pallbearers included Will Smith, Lennox Lewis, and Mike Tyson, with honorary pallbearers including George Chuvalo, Larry Holmes, and George Foreman. Ali's memorial was watched by an estimated 1 billion viewers worldwide. Chapter 11 Legacy Ali remains the only three time lineal heavyweight champion. He is the only boxer to be named the Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year six times, and was involved in more Ring Fight of the Year bouts than any other fighter. He was one of only three boxers to be named Sportsman of the Year by Sports Illustrated. Muhammad Ali was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in its first year and held wins over seven other Hall of Fame inductees during an era that has been called the Golden Age of Heavyweight Boxing. The Associated Press ranked him as the second best boxer and best heavyweight of the 20th century. His joint records of beating 21 boxers for the world heavyweight title and winning 14 unified title bouts stood for 35 years. In 1978, three years before Ali's permanent retirement, the Louisville Board of Aldermen in his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, voted 6 to 5 to rename Walnut Street to Muhammad Ali Boulevard. This was controversial at the time, as within a week 12 of the 70 street signs were stolen. Earlier that year, a committee of the Jefferson County Public Schools considered renaming Ali's alma mater, Central High School, in his honor, but the motion failed to pass. In time, Muhammad Ali Boulevard, and Ali himself, came to be well accepted in his hometown. Ali was named one of the 100 most influential Americans of the 20th century by Life magazine in 1990. In 1993, the Associated Press reported that Ali was tied with Babe Ruth as the most recognized athlete, out of over 800 dead or living athletes, in America. The study found that over 97% of Americans over 12 years of age identified both Ali and Ruth. He was the recipient of the 1997 Arthur Ashe Courage Award. At the end of the 20th century, he was ranked at or near the top of most lists of the century's greatest athletes. He was crowned Sportsman of the Century by Sports Illustrated. Named BBC's Sports Personality of the Century, he received more votes than the other five candidates combined. 
He was named Athlete of the Century by USA Today, and ranked as the third greatest athlete of the 20th century by ESPN Sports Century. Ali was named Kentucky Athlete of the Century by the Kentucky Athletic Hall of Fame in ceremonies at the Galt House East. In 1999, Time magazine named Ali one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century. On January 8, 2001, Muhammad Ali was presented with the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Bill Clinton. In November 2005, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President George W. Bush followed by the Otto Hahn Peace Medal in Gold of the UN Association of Germany, in Berlin for his work with the Civil Rights Movement and the United Nations, which he received on December 17, 2005. On November 19, 2005, Ali and his wife Lonnie Ali opened the $60 million non-profit Muhammad Ali Center in downtown Louisville. In addition to displaying his boxing memorabilia, the center focuses on core themes of peace, social responsibility, respect, and personal growth. On June 5, 2007, he received an honorary doctorate of humanities at Princeton University's 260th graduation ceremony. Ali Mall, located in Araneta Center, Quezon City, Philippines, is named after him. Construction of the mall, the first of its kind in the Philippines, began shortly after Ali's victory in a match with Joe Fraser in nearby Araneta Coliseum in 1975. The mall opened in 1976 with Ali attending its opening. The 1976 Muhammad Ali vs. Antonio Inoki fight played an important role in the history of mixed martial arts. In Japan, the match inspired Inoki's students Masakatsu Funaki and Minoru Suzuki to found Pancrase in 1993, which in turn inspired the foundation of Pride Fighting Championships in 1997. Pride was acquired by its rival, Ultimate Fighting Championship, in 2007. The Muhammad Ali Boxing Reform Act was introduced in 1999 and passed in 2000, to protect the rights and welfare of boxers in the United States. In May 2016, a bill was introduced to the United States Congress by Mark Wayne Mullen, a politician and former MMA fighter, to extend the Ali Act to mixed martial arts. In June 2016, U.S. Senator Rand Paul proposed an amendment to the U.S. draft laws named after Ali, a proposal to eliminate the selective service system. In 2015, Sports Illustrated renamed its Sportsman Legacy Award to the Sports Illustrated's Muhammad Ali Legacy Award. The annual award was originally created in 2008 and honors former sports figures who embody the ideals of sportsmanship, leadership and philanthropy as vehicles for changing the world. Ali first appeared on the magazine's cover in 1963 and went on to be featured on numerous covers during his storied career. On January 13, 2017, seven months or so after Ali's death, and four days before what would have been his 75th birthday, the Muhammad Ali Commemorative Coin Act was introduced into the 115th Congress, as H.R. 579 and as S. 166. However, both died within 10 days. Chapter 12, In the Media and Popular Culture As a world champion boxer, social activist, sex symbol and pop culture icon, Ali was the subject of numerous creative works including books, films, music, video games, TV shows, and other. Muhammad Ali was often dubbed the world's most famous person in the media. Several of his fights were watched by an estimated 1 to 2 billion viewers between 1974 and 1980, and his lighting of the torch at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics was watched by an estimated 3.5 billion viewers. Ali appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated on 38 different occasions, second only to Michael Jordan's 46. He also appeared on the cover of Time magazine five times, the most of any athlete. In 2015, Harris Poll found that Ali was one of the three most recognizable athletes in the United States, along with Michael Jordan and Babe Ruth. Martial artist and actor Bruce Lee was influenced by Ali whose footwork he studied and incorporated into his own style while developing Jeet Kune Do in the 1960s. On the set of Freedom Road Alley met Canadian singer-songwriter Michelle, 
and subsequently helped create Michelle's album The First Flight of the Giselda Dragon and an unaired television special featuring them both. Ali was the subject of the British television program This Is Your Life in 1978 when he was surprised by Eamon Andrews. Ali was featured in Superman vs. Muhammad Ali, a 1978 DC Comics comic book pitting the champ against the superhero. In 1979, Ali Guest starred as himself in an episode of the NBC sitcom Different Strokes. The show's title itself was inspired by the quote Different Strokes for Different Folks popularized in 1966 by Ali, who also inspired the title of the 1967 Seal Johnson song Different Strokes, one of the most sampled songs in pop music history. He also wrote several best selling books about his career, including The Greatest, My Own Story, and The Soul of a Butterfly. The Muhammad Ali effect, named after Ali, is a term that came into use in psychology in the 1980s, as he stated in The Greatest, My Own Story, I only said I was the greatest, not the smartest. According to this effect, when people are asked to rate their intelligence and moral behavior in comparison to others, people will rate themselves as more moral, but not more intelligent than others. When we were kings, a 1996 documentary about the rumble in the jungle, won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. The 2001 biopic Ali garnered a Best Actor Oscar nomination for Will Smith for his portrayal of Ali. Prior to making the film, Smith rejected the role until Ali requested that he accept it. Smith, said the first thing Ali told him was, Man, you're almost pretty enough to play me. In 2002, Ali was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for his contributions to the entertainment industry. His star is the only one to be mounted on a vertical surface, out of deference to his request that the name Muhammad, a name he shares with the Islamic prophet, not be walked upon. His 1966 fight against George Chuvalo was the subject of Joseph Blasioli's 2003 documentary film The Last Round, Chuvalo vs. Ali. The Trials of Muhammad Ali a documentary directed by Bill Siegel that focuses on Ali's refusal of the draft, during the Vietnam War, opened in Manhattan on August, 23, 2013. A 2013 made-for-TV movie titled Muhammad Ali's Greatest Fight dramatized the same aspect of Ali's life. On Twen Fuqua's documentary What's My Name, Muhammad Ali was released in 2019. Documentary filmmaker Ken Burns created the four-part documentary film Muhammad Ali, spanning over eight hours on Ali's entire life. Burns worked on the film since early 2016. It is scheduled to release in September 2021 on PBS. Dave Zirin who watched an eight-hour rough cut of this documentary called it utterly outstanding and said the footage they found will blow minds. Chapter 13, Discography I am the greatest. The Adventures of Ali, and his gang vs. Mr. Tooth Decay. Chapter 13 Section 1, Online. Muhammad Ali, American Boxer, in Encyclopedia Britannica Online, by Thomas Hauser, Adam Augustin, Piyush Bathia, Yamini Chauhan, John M. Cunningham, Richard Pallardi, Michael Ray, Emily Rodriguez, Sarabi Sinar, Amy Tikinen, Grace Young and the editors of Encyclopedia Britannica.